This is it, the final episode of the bit manipulation series. Today we're going to take a look at bit masking. I'm not going to waste any more time on this intro, so let us jump right in after the break. This is 0612TV. Welcome aboard. Hello and welcome to the last episode, episode 4 of Bit Manipulation. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use the tools we've discussed these past 3 episodes to actually use an entire number like it was a bunch of bits. There are of course many ways you can do this, you can use a loop and go in and get, you know, messy. But the process we're going to use today is going to be a lot more elegant. Now essentially, the idea for bit masking is that we're going to use a number and we're going to actually talk about its individual bits and you know, check to see if they're true or false, we can set them to true or false and things like that. For all the operations we're going to discuss, essentially we're going to be using bit shifts to point out individual bits. What this means of course is, essentially, we're going to have two numbers. The first number is your actual data, which means it's the actual number you're going to use to talk about its individual bits. And then for each action, we're going to create a new number that we can actually use to point out individual bits. So let's jump right in. First, let's talk about turning a bit on. That means regardless of its original value, we want to turn it on. Now, if we look at it in terms of a single bit, obviously, all you have to do is to do an all operation with one, and that will guarantee you that regardless of its original value, we will be able to turn a bit into one. Essentially, for a string of bits, that's exactly what we do, except for that string of bits, we only want to change one particular bit. Let's say in this string of bits, we want to change this particular bit. All we have to do is to introduce a new number. We're going to set the value of this number to 1. What this means, of course, is that in binary form, it's going to be all zeros except the rightmost digit, which is going to be 1. Then, we're going to bit shift it however many times until it lines up with the bit we want to change. Now, the 1 lines up with the bit I want to change, and everything else is 0. So now, I do an all operation between these two numbers. The result of this is a string of bits that looks almost like the original, Except now, I've set that bit to 1. And remember that no matter what the selected bit was originally, it's going to be set to 1 because of the OR operation. Now I hope you can kind of grasp that idea because we are essentially going to do this again and again for everything else. So what do I do with this new number? Obviously, I want this change to apply. And of course, what I have to do is this answer actually becomes the new number. So now, instead of holding that previous number, I'm going to use this new one instead. And of course, that will reflect the bit that has been changed. Now, there is another operation. Let's say we want to actually toggle the value of a bit. That means if it was 0, we want it to become 1. If it was 1, we want it to become 0. To do this, you XOR it with 1. Take a look at Y. This is the XOR truth table. 0 XOR 1, the value is 1. This means that the original value 0 has been changed to 1. 1 XOR 1 will give you 0. That is, 1 has been changed to 0. How do we do this practically to a string of bits? Obviously, we just give it 1, bit shift it however many times, and do an XOR operation. Whatever the bit was at that point of time, it will turn from true to false or false to true. So now that we've actually looked at switching a bit on and toggling the value of a bit, let us now take a look at switching a bit off. This one actually requires an extra step. Now, you see, to switch a bit off, all you have to do is to end it with zero. Obviously, the end truth table guarantees that the answer will be zero. However, as you can see, the normal steps we use to actually, you know, set to one and then bit shift isn't going to give you the correct value to do this operation with. Because obviously, if you just did it like this, what happens is you wipe out all these values and only keep the value you've selected, which is not what you want. What this means is that we actually have to not our new value before we perform an end operation. Doing the end operation after you've done not to the new number will actually guarantee that the value you've selected will be set to zero. Everything else is going to be reflected exactly. Now, for all these operations we've seen, they only work with one bit, as in they only modify the values of one bit. Obviously, if the input variable you give it is something more complex like this, 
Then of course the effect will happen everywhere we have 1 instead of 0 in the new number. As mentioned, this applies for the previous three operations we've looked at, that is setting to 0, setting to 1, and toggling. So now that we've taken a look at three operations that actually change the actual value, you realize it's not very useful in the sense that just being able to write to a number isn't useful if you can't read it back, which is why we are going to take a look at the last operation, that is to query. Essentially, the difference between this operation and the rest is that the answer from this operation will not be written back into the original number. The answer of this operation is going to be used for our own reference. Once we're done with that, we'll throw it away. And of course, the way you query is very simple. This is your original number. You introduce a new number like you always would. Use a bit shift to select which bit you want to look at. And then you perform an AND operation. If the bit you are querying is 0, Essentially what happens is, you will get a number that is all zeros. If that bit you are querying was 1, then you will get all zeros with a 1 at that position. So how is this a query? You see, what you have to do is you take the new number, and you actually look at its value. If its value is 0, essentially what that means is the value you were querying was false. But what if the bit you are trying to query was true? Essentially what happens is for any bit string that looks anything like this, its numerical form will be non-zero. It can be any value as small as 2, 4, 8, to huge values like 1024, 2048, but you don't have to worry about the exact value because you are guaranteed that it is non-zero. What this means is that at the end of a query operation, if you get a value that is non-zero, it means that the bit you queried was set to true. Essentially, that's it. That's all there is to bit masking. Essentially, we've taken a number and we've turned it into a bunch of bits that we can individually address, individually change, and individually query. Now, before I actually wrap up this episode, I want to talk a little bit more about motivations of bit masking because I don't feel I did an amazing job in the first episode. I also had some back and forth in the comments and there are some applications that I never covered. So first of all, thank you to YouTube user Fudge Bison. He mentioned compression as an application of bit mask. You see, if I have a bunch of true or false values, there are many ways in which I can store it to disk. Now, if I were to store it like this, yes, it works, but it takes up a lot more space than it has to. I could store it as ones and zeros, but that is still taking up a lot of space because of course, each number is at least eight bits. So instead, I could store a huge number. This might look like a lot of digits to you, but it's in fact just one number, which in this case only takes up 4 bytes, and I can use that to store 32 different boolean values. Another interesting application is in graphics. For those of you who do image editing, you notice things like masks. In fact, you know, the same name is actually used here. A simple mask is essentially another image that is only black and white. So what happens is, let's say now I want to layer one image on top of another and I want the top image to have a certain amount of transparency. What I can do is I can actually use a mask. Whatever is black on a mask will essentially mean transparent. Whatever that is white on a mask will essentially mean opaque. Essentially, you do an N operation between the mask and the top layer image. What happens then is that all parts of the top layer image that is ended with a black pixel must turn to black since of course that's how end works. Every white pixel on a mask that gets ended with the top layer image will then turn out you know essentially exactly the same as the pixel on the top layer image. Then now what we do is we grab the mask and we do a NOT operation to the mask essentially inverting its colors. Then we take the mask and perform an N operation with the lower layer. Now essentially what you've done is you've cut out a hole in the shape of the mask. All parts of the mask that are now set to black will then actually turn the pixels on the lower layer to black. What you can do now is you can now do an OR operation between all the pixels of the top and the bottom layer. You see, it's always black on one layer and colored on the other layer. What that means then is that you'll always get the color from the layer that actually has the color. What this means is basically what we've done is we've defined transparent layers for two originally opaque layers and then we have actually stuck them together into one image using nothing but bitwise operations. So there you have it. Essentially that's all with bitmasking that I've wanted to cover with you. 
Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully, especially this example that I just showed you, hopefully it was interesting. But yeah, that's really all there is for this episode on bit manipulation. I hope you've learned something. I hope you found this fun. If you have any comments, queries, or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out the official Twitter account for this channel at twitter.com slash 0612TV. As always, I appreciate every like, favorite, and subscription you give me. But until next time, you're watching 0612TV.